Hi, my name is Squash Falconer. I'm an adventurer, speaker and presenter and I ride motorcycles and I'm delighted to be here today to talk to Andy Dukes on the Ride and Talk podcast. Greetings all, Andy Dukes here again. Squash Falconer is a record-breaking adventurer, speaker and presenter. We first came into contact over a decade ago after she'd become the first British woman to climb and paraglide from the summit of Mont Blanc having ridden there from the UK on a BMW GS. Since then, she summited Mount Everest and also claims to be the world's highest ever bum boarder. But that's another story. Squash contacted me recently after a couple of years away from motorcycling following the birth of her first child. She'd got the old biking withdrawal symptoms and really wanted to get back in the saddle again. I said it was a great idea as there are some amazing bikes to try out in the current model lineup but that she'd need to come on Ride and Talk and tell us all about it. So here she is. It's Squash Falconer. Hello, it's great to have you on the podcast. Welcome to Ride and Talk. Hi, Andy. Thanks so much for having me on. It's lovely to chat to you. Lovely to hear you again. So we first came into contact about 12 years ago when I picked up a story about you jumping on a GS and riding about, I don't know, 1,200 kilometres from your home in the UK to the foot of Mont Blanc, which is the highest mountain in the Alps, then climbing to the top and paragliding from the summit. Can you remember where on earth that idea came from? (laughs) Yes, um, I know exactly where the idea came from. So it was actually built up from three dreams that I had. Um, When I was younger, I I grew up on a farm. We rode motorbikes, you know, quads and trikes and bikes, and I always loved them. And when I first passed my test, I had this daydream that I'd like to ride a motorbike to the south of France. And um, there wasn't time for things like that. So I kind of put it in the back of my mind, but I thought I'd always like to do that. And then um, a few years later, I, I did a ski season, actually, when I was 18, and from where I was living, I had a view of Mont Blanc and I, I wasn't a mountaineer or anything, but I used to look at the peak and think people climb that mountain and um, that'd be quite a cool thing to do. Um, but again, it wasn't something that, that was there was time for and I wasn't a climber. So I put that to the back of my mind. And then a few years later, I was learning to paraglide. And um, while I was learning to fly, I thought to myself, this is a brilliant way to um, get down from a mountain to, to fly down. I thought I'd love to climb a high peak and fly off the top of it. And again, I just put it to the back of my mind. And then it was it wasn't until I'd been mountaineering for a few years and I'd climbed a much bigger peak, Chawoya, which is one of the 8000 metre peaks that I didn't know what I was going to do next. And it kind of came back round. And I thought to myself, you know what? I could ride a motorbike from England to the foot of Mont Blanc in the south of France. I could climb it. And then if I got to the top, well, I could jump off and fly down on my paraglider. So it was sort of a dream that took years to evolve. But that's how it came about. So forget the paragliding part for a minute then, because I believe that probably only about one in three people succeed, you know, in summiting Mont Blanc. So I guess the odds are are stacked against a lot of people. Yeah. So when I set out to do it, I mean, I absolutely wasn't convinced it was doable, not because I I wasn't going to give it 100 percent, but for exactly those reasons you've said, you know, to actually summit a mountain, the, the odds are against you because of altitude and getting the right weather. Um, And then if I were to summit, um, to have the right conditions to be able to fly off, I knew were like minimal. But um, I just I I gave myself a month to do it. Climbing Mont Blanc takes two or three days. So we knew we'd have multiple attempts. Um, But after the second attempt failed, I thought, yeah, this isn't looking good. And it was getting towards the end of September and it was our last chance and I just thought this probably isn't going to happen but obviously I gave it my all and it did happen you know we re- we actually reached the summit and it was too windy and I was just like oh I can't believe it was so close and we stayed up there because we had time and after about an hour the wind died down and Erwin my climbing partner the guy I'd done it with said we can do this and we set our wings up and took off and yeah the, the final kind of moment it all came together. Wow. So like you say, what, two or three days for the ascent, but how long for the descent? Yeah. So because we were acclimatized and we'd already been up there a couple of times, nearly to the summit, it took us two days to get up on the third attempt and 22 minutes to fly back down. (laughs) It was fantastic. Describe your feelings on that flight then. Okay, so when we took off, it was quite funny because we didn't know which way the wind would be blowing. We didn't know which direction we'd take off in. And the car was parked on uh, in France in one of the fields um, on that side of the mountain. So when we took off, because of the wind, we had to take off in the direction of Italy. And 
we were happy with that because it, just to fly down was going to be great. But we actually thought we were going to end up landing in Italy. But Erwin said to me, because I took off first, he said, if you can turn right and get back over the, the coal, over the saddle that's on the right side of Mont Blanc, he said, there's a chance we'll be able to go and land as close to the car as possible. And I mean, it's scary when you take off on big mountains in unknown places that you haven't flown before. And especially for me, I hadn't really been flying for that long. Um, so... I was excited about it, but I was also super nervous, totally aware of all the things that could go wrong. I took off. And one of the reasons that I went first is because if something went wrong on takeoff, Erwin wanted to be there to help me. But obviously with going first, you're the first one into the unknown and the other person's then following you. So once I'd actually taken off, that was amazing. I was like, could breathe a sigh of relief. But then I had all the stress of getting back over the cold to get back into France. And I thought I can make this, but it was a bit tight so as I was flying back towards the mountain I thought if I lose any height I'm gonna have to quickly do a u-turn and go back again so I kind of as daft as it sounds I, I remember picking my feet up going over this coal even though I was you know a few hundred meters above it and I, I was just I was thrilled I was so ecstatic to get over it because then I knew it was just a glide in and coming into land and I was slightly apprehensive about the landing because I got crampons on my feet. Obviously, from the climb, I'd got the ice axe hanging off my um, my harness because I got my climbing gear with me. So I knew that I needed to be quite careful about my landing. And I saw the car and I set everything up and I came down to land and I literally I landed in the grass field. And because I got my crampons on, they stuck straight into the ground and I face planted. So there was nothing graceful about the landing. But, you know, to have landed just 20 metres from the car was just I, I couldn't actually believe it. I had to almost pinch myself. That's brilliant. Yeah, fantastic. And the ride home, it must have been such a different experience from the ride down with all the anticipation and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I could finally sort of relax, you know, because I don't I don't know if you knew, but before the trip, I had put the trip together basically um, by pulling in quite a lot of favours. I got some sponsorship because when I decided to do it, I didn't actually have a motorbike or a paraglider or a video camera. And I, I wanted all that I needed all those things. Um, and I didn't have any money to go and buy those things. So I'd ended up going to see the BBC and saying to them, look, BMW are behind this trip. The entire thing's organised. I'll be de definitely be able to do it. I've been to see BMW. I told them the BBC were behind the trip. The entire thing was organised and everything was you know, going to definitely happen. And, and then I went to I spoke to Ozone Paragliders and I said to them, like, BMW and the BBC are backing this. Like, can you loan me the light, right glider? They were like, no problem, Squash. We'll, we'll loan you a lightweight mountain glider for a month. Um BBC said, look, we can't really be seen to have anything to do with this because of health and safety, but we will lend you the video, the camera equipment that you need. And it wasn't until four days before I was due to leave that um, the BMW dealership, it was my local dealer that I'd gone to, actually agreed and said, look, we'll lend you um, uh, the six. 50 GS for a month and it kind of all came together so as I rode down I was like wow like I've, I've got to get something for these guys you know they've, they've all trusted me and believed in me and then obviously I did it which was fantastic and after I'd done it before the ride home I found out that I was the first British woman to fly from the summit of Mont Blanc so not only had I done it but I'd got this record so the press were interested so it, it just yeah I mean it just couldn't have been better so I just was super relaxed and I I really enjoyed the ride back. I bet, yeah, that's just that's a brilliant story. And nothing like putting yourself under pressure either, is there? But yeah, you made it happen, so fair play to you. Let's talk about the biggie then, because I think two years after setting that record on Mont Blanc, you'd set your sights on, you know, realising every mountaineer's dream to reach the roof of the world, Mount Everest. So we're going to talk about childbirth later. But that aside, would you say that climbing Everest was the hardest thing you've ever done in your life? Yeah, I mean, Everest, actually, it wasn't a mountain for me. I, there was when I started climbing, mountaineering, it wasn't the peak that I was going for. You know, a lot of people that do it talk about wanting to do it from an early age and everything. That that wasn't me. I, I got into climbing mountains because my friends were doing it and I realised that it was something that I liked and enjoyed. But yeah, Everest was not on the list. And then when I climbed Chao Oyu in 2008, that was my first 8,000 metre peak, um, I, I got into a bit of trouble on that mountain um, on the way down, had a bit of an accident, um, got stuck in a rope abseiling down from the summit. And my climbing partner was able to get me down and help me out and everything. And, and it was it was a hairy like time, but it was fine. It was only sort of scary for five minutes. But somebody did a very similar thing a couple of days later when we were in base camp having summited. And um, this guy actually died in the spot where I'd got into trouble. 
and it really kind of hit home sort of the dangers of everything and as we were walking out the mood was you know it was, it was low it's a hard thing to take when stuff like that happens on the mountain and you're questioning why you're there and what you're doing and this teammate said to me squash you are absolutely strong enough to climb Everest and I think because of everything that had happened like I just pushed I just said thank you and just pushed it away and thought oh, after all this like there's no way and then but I think what happened was it did plant a seed but I left it alone and then Mont Blanc was the year later 2009 and like you say it was such an amazing trip and it it really made me think you know when you go for something even if it's absolutely outrageous you can pull things off and I just thought squash you've got to try and so after doing Mont Blanc I started to believe that maybe I could do more than I thought I could and that's when the Everest thing started coming back and and yeah and that's when I started putting things together after the Mont Blanc trip and it was in 2011 that I went to climb Everest and I can honestly say that it was the hardest thing I'd ever done at the time physically mentally and I always talk about Everest as an extra step emotionally I, I stepped into a different realm on that mountain just about 10 years ago then around about this time oh goodness me yeah yeah just I just had the 10 year anniversary so can you describe for us what it's like to be on top of the world like that the emotion the feeling um I think it's always a bit of a disappointment when I tell people this but it was absolutely horrific I think what people sort of forget is when you get to the top of the mountain you're halfway there so actually when we got to the top of Mount Everest we still had to get back down because the weather was so bad, 30 metres below the summit, I sort of said, I I'm done. I don't know if I can get back down because the whole time you're checking yourself. Can I get back down from here? Can I get back down from here? And I was starting to question if I could. And I said to Jang Boon, my climbing Sherpa and close friend, like, well, I say I said I shouted because the wind was blowing. I was like, I don't know if I can get back down from here. And he was like, we're close. We're so close, squash. So I was just like, well, if I've overcooked it, I've overcooked it. I'm going to get there now. We're, we're so close. And we got to the top and I actually was attempting to be the first woman in the world to fly from the summit of Mount Everest. I'd heard about that. Yeah. yeah I wasn't was sure if it was true or not. <laughs> you yeah. were actually planning to paraglide off the mount, off the summit of Mount Everest. Yes. Oh, man. Yeah, so I was attempting to be the first woman in the world to paraglide from the summit of Mount Everest. And I absolutely knew that, you know, the odds were massively stacked against me and it would be probably 1% chance that I'd be able to do it. But, yeah, so taking the paraglider up to the summit because what happens is when you go for the summit there's a very small window and we'd made our push from base camp so uh, you know you leave base camp you get to camp one camp two camp three then camp four and and actually if you hang about or tr delay you're losing condition when you're up there you're in the death zone and I knew that I had to go for that summit push because I was losing condition up there and quite a few people made the decision when we set off at eight o'clock night from camp four to go to the summit quite a few people made the decision to turn back when the weather started to deteriorate but I and they were saying we'll rest at camp four and try again tomorrow but I knew if I did that there'd be no going back tomorrow there'd be one way I was going and that was down so this was my actually only shot to get to the top so I knew quite early on into the summit push I wasn't going to be able to fly um but I, I kept pushing and um obviously reached the summit um but yeah it was it I was at the top for seven minutes ish and it was pretty horrendous but it once I got back down that's when all the amazing feelings came that's when the emotion came that's when the wow I've done this and the feeling was I mean even now talking about it like I can feel it I I almost can't quite believe that I have stood on top of Mount Everest and it's it's phenomenal I mean it's such a privilege and I just I'm amazed by it every time I talk about it and think about it absolutely yeah fantastic just out of interest what's your scariest moment on a mountain been probably on Mont Blanc when I was climbing with Irwin it was on the second attempt we were um climbing up some ice so we were stabbing our crampons in um stabbing the ice axes in and we were roped together and I was leading and I actually lost my footing and I fell off and as I fell the rope went tight because obviously it Irwin's weight but instead of it him stopping me all I did was pull him off so he fell off I managed to arrest myself I stopped, but he was falling. He fell past me and pulled me off again. So at that point, I was like, this is like, we are falling and we are both going in that crevasse because there was a crevasse below us. But we both managed to stop ourselves and there was complete silence. And I just said, sorry about that. And then 
we carried on and it wasn't until we got back in the car the next day that we talked about it and we were both yeah it, it really shook us and that was probably the most terrifying because sometimes when you're in a scary situation like when I was on Chao Oyu, you're very busy dealing with it so it doesn't have quite the impact and although I was busy dealing with arresting myself I think it kind of happened in slow motion yeah I can I can relate to that from having maybe gone into a corner too fast on a bike and having two choices do you sit the bike up and keep going off the track or off the road or do you just dig in and lean in that yeah. little bit more completely trust that rubber and you get around it but yeah. then you have that moment where everything just catches up with you afterwards and you have this incredible feeling of got away with one there got away with one there so yeah goodness me anyway moving on from uh mountaineering for a bit because you know fantastic memories for you and amazing adventures but adventure bikes are for adventures of course as well so i guess it's no surprise that you know in your quest for uh, adventures it's often included motorcycles and, and you're a big gs fan i know that and you've ridden gs's in some amazing places too aside of mont blanc so tell us a little bit about that travel documentary series that you presented when you, i think you explored argentina chile peru colombia all of those countries on an f800 gs yeah that's right so i did um an adventure travel documentary and the first part of that the first 3000 miles um i was on a gs 800 so we arrived in argentina picked the bike up in buenos aires traveled around different parts of argentina um into chile and then into peru and that's when it, it was Lima, Peru, that said goodbye to the bike. So I had six weeks, I think, of the trip where I was riding on the bike. And it was just amazing. I mean, I think from the Mont Blanc trip, the bike was I realized that a bike could be such an amazing way to make up an adventure. And I think to go out to South America and explore these places, linking them up with the bike was really special because you know what it's like when you're on a motorbike. It's so different to being on on a bus or in a car you know you're you're out there with the elements and you can kind of access different places and I think when you're riding a bike you're you're very present aren't you you have to be so I was just there in the sort of submerged in it all it, it was wonderful South America is uh, just an incredible place isn't it to explore yeah totally and you know we rode um, we rode to, through the Atacama Desert as well so it was real extremes with the riding. And I remember one morning we were in, um, let me think what it was called, San, San Pedro de Atacama. And we stayed there. So it's sort of in the middle of the desert. And we got up and we went to, we rode to the um, the Gizas in San Pedro. And because of, obviously you're at the altitude. So we got up at four in the morning. It was absolutely freezing cold. I got on the bike. I was frozen and I rode the bike up to the geezers and it's, um, you know, volcanic geothermal fields. So all the sort of hot air and steam's rising as, as the sun came up, it got warmer and warmer and we actually boiled eggs very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Which was a really great experience. And then, and then we rode back in the heat of the, the desert. So I'd gone from minus, I don't know what, bitterly cold riding to absolutely sweltering temperatures um, and that was a really memorable day and then we we ended up in this village and this um, older lady had come out and said she wanted to do a blessing so we thought that would be a really good thing to watch and she wanted to bless the motorbike as well so we took the motorbike along and it basically just involved her getting getting us to buy quite a lot of alcohol and she sprayed myself and the bike with all this alcohol and blessed me and the bike and told me we'd have a fantastic journey but it, it was just amazing you know it was a really really cool experience. Just tell me, because I know you've ridden a lot of different bikes and we're going to talk a little bit about those in a while, but the F800 GS, I mean, I, I rode one halfway around the world before changing to another one and I still think it's one of the most underrated bikes out there and certainly, you know, compared to the F650 GS that you rode at Mont Blanc or rode to Mont Blanc, it's an incredible bike, isn't it, the 800, it, especially off-road as well, it's very capable, isn't it? Yeah, so I'd ridden the 650, the 800 and the 1200, and I went for the 800. And I think for me, I mean, the riding position, phenomenal. I could just, I mean, there were days when I rode four or 500 miles a day consecutively. Um, no problem at all. So that was, I mean, but that's kind of on the GSs. But in terms of the 800, I think just the capability and the power is perfect. It's the 650, it didn't feel enough after I'd ridden the 800. 
and the 1200 just it was just that bit bigger and I felt more agile and able to kind of have almost more speed on the 800 because I was more agile if that makes sense so it was just a really beautiful fit and yeah the bike just everything I asked of it I mean to be honest the bike is it's got far more capabilities than I have it's it's easy to ride isn't it It was just always very easy to ride you know very forgiving yeah yeah so can, totally. can you make a comparison maybe you can between the like the feelings of exhilaration that you get from riding a motorcycle hard and those that you maybe get from flying off the summit of a mountain or base jumping or any of the other sort of crazy challenges that you set yourself yeah totally actually they, they're all very similar because i think it's that exposure it's it's the speed and it's the exposure so when you're paragliding there's a speed there's the the air is in your face and it's just you and the elements and i get that on mountains flying a paraglider on the motorbike but particularly where speed's involved um so yeah i think it's it's a very similar feeling and i think the other thing is is that all of them require you to be absolutely present because if you're not completely present your life's in danger And so I think being that present, I mean, it's the ultimate mindfulness, isn't it? And I think that's what, you know, I often talk about my adventures making me feel alive. Well, you feel so alive because you're so focused, so awake and so in it, because if you're not, you're going to die. And I think that's what they all absolutely have in common. Yeah, absolutely. Make you feel alive. I like that. So when we last met in person, I think back in 2016, it was in the French Alps and you were ski touring and guiding and and generally felt to me like you're living the dream but your life's changed massively since then i mean you've begun your biggest adventure yet and become a mother but typically you didn't do that the easy way did you (laughs) no i guess not i mean it was it was um having a baby and doing the work and the life and living the life that i lived were never gonna go hand in hand that well so when kit came along i mean when i got pregnant i actually it was interesting for me i I always imagined that i'd be the mother that was running and doing activities right up until the moment the baby was born but i had a couple of complications and early on in the pregnancy i i didn't know i was pregnant and i was ski touring and i was out there with a group so i was altitude i was the fittest i'd been all season but what i was creating inside my body was the perfect storm of thicker blood because i was pregnant so my blood was running thicker i was at altitude so my blood was thicker and i ended up with a deep vein thrombosis um so that was the first kind of hurdle in the pregnancy but that was okay it got it got spotted after a bit of back and forth and bit of a scare but it was all okay um but then um we discovered that there was further complications and i was put on bed rest so actually uh, there was no gradual getting used to getting bigger and slowing down i was just like stop everything stopped um so it, it wasn't until well when kit was born that i started to get my freedom back a lot of people have their baby and they lose it well i actually started to get mine back but again that wasn't straightforward she came two months early so it was a pretty tough start but do you know what I I wrote a blog while I was in hospital and a lot of people asked me how I was coping because I actually stayed in the hospital for the entire seven weeks we were in there with her and I said I I used my experience on Everest you know and the expeditions that I'd done because it was literally about what is the focus what is the goal getting my head down and just every single day doing what I needed to do to to survive and for Kit to survive and get stronger and I just, I just literally told myself every day, I was like, Squash, you've climbed Everest, you can do this. <laughs> Fantastic. That's brilliant. I've noticed that Kit's middle name is Elspeth. Any connection there to you know who? <laughs> yes. Kit's middle name is Elspeth after Elspeth Beard. I met her in 2016 at Motrad Days and, and she was already on my radar because I'd come across that famous photograph of her. And I thought that was a cool photograph. And then I realised who she was and I thought, wow. And I ended up sitting next to her at the dinner at the Motrad Days. And I just thought, what an incredible woman. Did you read her book yet, Lone Rider? Because it's a, it's a really special book. Yeah, so she um, she actually sent a copy to Kit after Kit was born. Um and, I, and I've read it and it's fantastic. And she's just released another book, hasn't she? Lone Rider, The Photographs, which is absolutely brilliant as well. Um, and Kit's met her. And it's actually it's actually Elspeth that came round on her motorbike a few weeks ago. And I sat on it. And it's the first motorbike that I've sat on since uh, it's been four years. So since before Kit was born. And that was the moment I was like, oh, I do miss this. And I'd like to ride a motorbike again. Because honestly... Andy, when I, when Kit was born, I didn't think I'd ride a bike again. 
So what bike uh, was was Elspeth riding? Because I know that it might not have been a around the world bike, but I know she's got another another bike as well, hasn't she? Yeah, it was her GS Basic, so it wasn't the bike she went around the world on. Oh, I love that bike. I've I've always said to her if she ever fancies selling that bike, uh, put me put me on the waiting list for sure. So. So you grew up on a farm, like you said earlier, surrounded by nature, but with a healthy dose of motorcycles, quads and other machinery thrown in the mix, which obviously sowed the seeds for your life of risk taking and adventure. I'm wondering if you want the same kind of childhood for Kit. Oh, that's the, the million dollar question, isn't it? Like I absolutely I want her to ride motorbikes, climb mountains, paraglide, do all the things she wants to do. As a parent, it is so tough because I want to encourage her to follow her, all her dreams, but yeah, I think I'll just be mortified when I know she's out doing those things because I know the dangers. And actually, one of the first things I did when Kit was born was apologise to both my parents. <laughs> yeah, we know what we put them through now, don't we? Exactly. Yeah, well, yeah, but I mean, thank goodness I didn't know what I was putting them through. So yeah, so when Kit was born, I, I felt my own mortality in ways that I'd not experienced before, and I, I kind of had this this need to preserve myself to protect her and be there for her so even you know things like going out for a run I was like what if a car hits me what if something happens what if I can't get back to her um so early on yeah there was just no way I was going to go back to bikes and then I put it out of my mind because it just it just wasn't an option I, I just I I haven't wanted to take any risks and then obviously when Elspeth came to visit and I I sat on a motorbike I literally sat on it and was like wow I want to ride a motorbike again and I, I was I was quite shocked. Um, but yeah, that's that's when it started. And then, yeah, and then obviously I spoke to you and, and I had a, a think about it. And and then I got in touch with BMW and, and it was great because within two weeks, I think I was on the F900XR, which is a bike that I absolutely love. Um, and yeah, I, I had that for three weeks. And yeah, it's certainly scratched an itch and, and made me realise that my biking days are absolutely not over. I've not ridden the 900 XR. I mean, you've had GSs, you've had 90s. So how does the XR stack up against them then? So I actually had um, an XR 1000 after the GS 800. And I really liked it back in the UK because it's like the perfect combination for me of an adventure bike because of the sit-up position and the touring position, um, which is super comfortable. So you can just ride and ride and ride. But it's got the speed and the agility of a road sort of race style bike which is also lovely but I couldn't maintain for any length of time you know decent length of time so for me that that bike was I, I just loved it so I guess that was quite a few years it was five years ago I was on the XR1000 and then to get on the um, F900 XR I, I was really blown away by the bike I mean it's fantastic the bike is just there's such clever pieces of kit aren't there it's got three modes on it you know dynamic rain and road and I was messing about with them and I, I, they are really different. You know, the bike rides differently. The balance on it is beautiful. I know you shouldn't say this, but you can literally ride along with your arms and legs out and, and it just balances perfectly. You know, I've, I've seen people do that. I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, yeah, and it just, I, I feel so comfortable. that The control is just fantastic. And then it's got that lovely speed and power so you kind of you can almost be sort of on a race bike one second and on a touring bike the next but you're on the same bike and I managed to um, do a road trip to North Wales I just had 24 hours child free and I went up there and kind of did a micro adventure and I went wild swimming I did a bit of climbing I rode the bike out on a beach next to the sea and um, it was fantastic and everything about why I love bikes and why I do and did what I did just all came flooding back and I was like yeah it's still there it's just that there's a time and a place isn't there brilliant that's great I mean so you kind of packed a load of things into the 24 hours so how important are those micro adventures you know as opposed to no adventures oh massively I mean I think the, the one thing that having Kit has made me realise is that you can pack an awful lot into a very short space of time when you've only got that short space of time. And it just utterly recharges me. You know, I can even half an hour, even jumping off the bike, getting into some cold water, having a swim for 10 minutes, a wild swim and then back on the bike and back home. You know, it's it's as if I've lived 24 hours in two. Just having the bike in the garage and being able to, I had half an hour one day and I was like, that's a bit ridiculous to go for a ride. But I did. And it was just wonderful. And I didn't go, I, there was no destination or anything. I just went out for a ride and it was just, it was exhilarating. It was wonderful. It blew the cobwebs away, literally. 
you know, I got that feeling. I, I, I guess it's like a meditation, isn't it? Quite a quite a um, intense meditation. Absolutely, yeah. And it's all about focus, like you said earlier. So, a final word of advice for our listeners, squash. Then, why do you think it's important to choose life experiences over material things? Then, because I think life experiences give you an actual feeling inside that kind of comes inside out and it makes up who you are and how you feel and I think material things are fleeting you know they you you have them and they perhaps give you a buzz for a minute but it's not it's not part of who you are or it doesn't give you that same chemical that same release I mean nothing like that so yeah the the real experiences are the ones to to go for couldn't agree with you more and i'm sure many of our listeners they're they're going to be inspired to consider where they are in life and what they're doing and and what they have to do to perhaps make make their lives even more exciting i i suppose in motorcycling terms it's it's all about making life a ride isn't it but who knows maybe we'll be chatting to a few of them on a future ride and talk so squash as always it's been a real pleasure catching up and thanks for being our guest today thanks so much andy love chatting to you cheers squash It's always inspiring talking to you and hearing about all your stories. I really like the concept of these micro-adventures that you mentioned. And you're right, you can pack a lot of memories into a short time. All you need to do is make a plan, get on your bike and make it happen. No excuses. Right, I'd love to say that I'm off to climb a mountain, jump out of a plane or swim an ocean. But I am at least going to shut things down here and ride my bike. So take care out there and I hope you'll all join us again for the next episode of Ride and Talk. Bye for now.